we are not spending enough time with the Word of God. You know, he told us everybody should have that pocket Bible. And of course, it's funny because most people nowadays have it on their smartphone or their whatever. But we, we carry it, the Word of God with us. We don't have to lug the heavy Bible every time anymore. And uh, I just think that that is so key, that we weave Scripture into everything we do in faith formation, from our opening prayer through our, um, you know, uh, actual content of the of the. Um, of that what session through the the close uh, there is a priest in Iowa but I cannot remember which parish when we were doing generations of faith training he says they begin in every and end everything at the baptismal font and I loved that idea even when volunteers come to stuff the bulletin they start at the baptismal font so that it's a way of saying yes to my baptismal call everything is connected to that and Pope Francis has said very strongly, you know, that the baptismal call is a great way to connect with people. But he also says every one of us should read scripture every day. And whether we give the question of the week to our people or whatever way we, we weave it in, he talks to us how important that is. And in, and in Evangelii Gaudium, how many, even in the introduction, how many scriptures did he use in the introduction to the document? And they were all this kind of scripture. They were about the abundant joy that we get from being people of God, how much God loves us, how graced we are. And uh, he just quoted the most amazing, uplifting scripture passages, not the ones that beat people over the head, but the ones that make people feel welcomed and accepted. Now, I have to tell you, um, in my Renew group, and you know, original Renew is like 30 years old now, my group's been together all 30 years. Now, a couple people have come and gone, but there are about six of us from the original group. It was all ladies um, at that time, it was either women, who, there, I was the single one, there was one divorced woman in our group, uh, one widow, and the rest, husbands didn't want to do renew. <laughs> and we're still together, although there are, uh, they're all widows now. We don't have any husbands left from our group. But I taught some of the women in my group, I taught their daughters, because I was their high school religion teacher. And um, these women worry about not being tough enough with young people today. That's their issue. That they think, you know, the whole problem is we haven't been strict enough teaching the content of faith and the thou shalt nots. I am intrigued by that because Pope Francis is saying the opposite message is the one that's going to work with people. And I know we have to dance that fine line, walk that tightrope between, you know, doctrine and and uh, the more communal side of it, the encounter side. But I think Francis is kind of listing toward, you don't do doctrine if you don't have a loved relationship with Jesus. And sometimes we have put the cart before the horse, right? Think about the opportunities for scripture in the year of mercy. To take, you know, Peter cockily thinking he's going to get praised for saying, do I have to forgive seven times? And Jesus pulling his hair out, oh, Peter, not again, 70 times seven. And just what we can do with that in our adult, our youth, our children's catechesis. It just is such an opportunity uh, for that. God bless you. And Pope Francis keeps saying we have a model, and he doesn't point to himself, does he? He says Jesus is the model. And look at how Jesus created that culture of encounter. Jesus rubbed up against people, skin to skin, and I don't mean to offend safe environment policy when I say that. I panic many more. I'm always thinking, did that sound inappropriate? But, you know, we really need to not worry so much that we don't and provide that encounter, that it's such a sterile environment that nothing, you know, skin to skin can happen. And the way Jesus encountered is, is Pope Francis says, our model. Uh, uh, the ten lepers, I love that image, that art of people, you know, the, the, all the poor and the crippled. I guess that, that isn't the ten lepers. Is it? That's when a whole bunch of people came to be healed by Jesus. And he just, you know, every one of them was special to him. Jesus also, I think Francis is reminding us, got the order right. And Jesus taught us, you don't 
catechize someone who hasn't been evangelized, right? And you and I have been living in that era now for quite a few years, and it's not like Francis created that. I think the new evangelization with John Paul reminded us of, of that, and youth ministry has said for a long time, you know, the seven original and now eight components of youth ministry. Evangelization is the, the umbrella, right? Catechesis, as the documents, the GDC and the NDC say, catechesis is a moment in evangelization. And again, I think that's the big picture, that we are first asking, are we evangelizing? And then we set our catechetical programs accordingly. But we start with evangelization, not catechesis. Jesus, when did he, when did he um, tell the woman caught in adultery to sin no more? At the end of the conversation, right? First he saved her life. <laughs> first he had the human loving contact with her. But he did, at the end, tell her not to do it anymore. There was catechesis in that encounter, but it came in the right order. Now, Pope Francis has been you know, talking to us about what the most important content is. He doesn't get into which textbook series we should be using or anything like that. But he does talk about content. And he says you've got to keep Jesus at the center. I was interviewing young adult Catholics, uh, both those who were active in the church as people in their 20s and 30s, and ones we knew were baptized Catholic but had drifted away. We were trying to figure out what was the difference in their life experience. And I knew one um, I, who uh, I was going to be interviewing in her home, who I, I knew had left the Catholic Church for a fundamentalist religion. And I knew what her agenda was going to be when she invited me into her kitchen and the Bible was open on the table. <laughs> and, you know, because she was a cute, I mean, it wasn't true. I had to bite my tongue because I wasn't there to proselytize. I was there to listen. But, you know, oh, the Catholic Church doesn't go to the Word. I want to say, yes, we do, or we should anyway, you know. And that, but then she said, Said she left the Catholic Church because it talked too much about the church and not enough about Jesus. And sometimes aren't we guilty of that? And that's another thing. I think that's one of the big questions. Is Jesus at the heart of everything we do? And do we tell our catechists that uh, they need to remember that too and keep Jesus at the center. Um, Pope Francis also puts the poor and vulnerable at the center. I have never, never been so in awe of how the Pope brings us to the dignity of every human person and especially those on the margins, be they the poor, be they unborn babies, be they people on death row, be they whomever that he really challenges us to go there. And his tweets are all about that too. Talk about uh, an older person using technology. Now some people say he doesn't write his own tweets, but I'd like to think he does, so I'm just gonna not listen to them and say <laughs> he is writing his own tweets. But he just socks it to you with his tweets, doesn't he? But they're all about that, that uh, heart of the message, not the ex extras or the externals, but the heart of the message. And I think that's what evokes that passion in, in our younger people, um, that they get excited when they see themselves <laughs> as living the gospel, Matthew 25, whatever you would want to call it. Uh, that's what inspires us. The second thing I want to talk about is leadership. From, that has a Pope Francis effect because he has taught me so much about leadership since he became our Pope. And the first thing is how important it is to be humble. How important it is for all of us to smell like the sheep and not be sour pusses. All the different ways in which he describes good leadership in the church. But this, to me, is so key. Do we invite our volunteers in youth ministry, our catechists in faith formation, those who help us with adult learning, do we remind them all of us in leadership have to have this disposition, that we are humble, 
that it's by the grace of God. One of the books that most changed my life as a college student majoring in theology at Briarcliff in Sioux City was the book called, I can't remember the author, I have to look that up to give him credit, but the name of the book was The Father is Very Fond of Me. Do some of you remember that, Jim? And the, his whole premise was when people would compliment him, he would always take a step back and say, the father is very fond of me. You know, my, um, my boss is from California, and he uh, 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 likes to tell the story of when you compliment Midwesterners, we, like on, on your pretty top, we, we say, oh, I bought it at Target, or something like that. He said, when you compliment a Californian, they'll thank you and think of five other things you should have complimented them on. Now, he's from California, so he said it, not me. But, you know, that, that whole sense of, of what, what does genuine humility really mean, it means I recognize recognize the Father is very fond of me when good things happen or I have gifts. But he also, the book also went on to say, um, when bad things happen, he said, I say it with different intonation, the Father is very fond of me and I need to hang on to that. So that whole message of humility. Um, you know, the Pope talked about if I had to choose between a bruised church uh, or a, a church involved in navel gazing, self-absorbed, or self-absorbed church, I choose the bruised church that gets beat up on the streets. And is that what our faith formation looks like? Is it a little beaten up? Because it isn't afraid to go to the streets. This didn't make it into the, the document coming out of the Extraordinary Synod on the Family last fall. I know Pope Francis is going to be pushing for it because this was his term, uh, but the bishops didn't quite buy into it permanently yet last fall, but maybe this fall they will. But you heard him talk, right, uh, uh, from the Synod on how important it is that church leaders, people like you, apply the principle of graduality to how we greet people. There is, Pope Francis said, no perfect family. There is no perfect adolescent. There is no perfect um, older person. We are all on the journey. And he said, our job as church leaders is to meet people however they present themselves to us. And what does that say to leadership? Do you train your volunteers, your catechists, anyone helping you with faith formation or youth ministry or adult faith formation, whatever it is, do you train them not just on the logistical part of their job or the, you know, the specific catechesis, but do you also train them to be humble, to reach people where they are, welcome them however they present themselves to you, to your parish? And part of that is sharing our own imperfections, right? When I started teaching, I was only 22, I was a farm girl. Omaha girls were very city girl-ish to me as the farm girl. And some of them, were, I was teaching seniors. So they were four years younger than me, you know, 18 and I'm 22. They're the city girls, I'm the country girl. And Briarcliff in those days was pretty sheltered yet. This little ca private, you know, Catholic school run by those Dubuque Franciscans. And oh my gosh, they so intimidated me. And I wanted to be, you know, have the answer to every question that they would ask me as their religion teacher. It took about mm, 10 seconds for me to realize that was not going to happen. And so I learned early on, but it's been a gift to me ever since, that they most resonate with us when we share our struggles with them. And Pope Francis has told us to do that, that we share warts and all what's going on in our life and that we don't present ourselves as, as perfect. Francis also talks about who are the target audiences for, uh, uh, for faith formation, but especially for evangelization. And in Evangelii Gaudium, he names three groups, a little different from how um, John Paul in the New Evangelization documents framed it, because John Paul talked about two basic groups. Um, well, I should take a step back and say Paul VI in the original document in 1975 said bringing the good news into every strata of society, but especially to people who didn't know Jesus. John Paul says, take it to your core so that they can become evangelizers of other. And then he, the a second group he named were the disengaged. Now, John, uh, uh, um, Francis 
kind of the same, just breaks it down a little bit more. He talks first about the faithful who have a relationship with God. Sometimes we take them for granted instead of challenging them to go even deeper so they can become peer evangelizers. Young families with young families. I was just talking to um, uh, one of my um, colleagues at the center. He is 30 years old. He has three little boys, two, one, and zero. And he just did our family workshop in San Antonio. And there he said, um, people said to him, do you have any wisdom from your own lived experience? <laughs> and he said, yes, don't ask families in my, w with little children, like don't ask us to, to be uh, true to a set schedule. He said, even mass has changed with those three babies. They used to always have a preferred mass when it was just uh, Angel and Ashley. But now with the boys, you know, they might go here if five o'clock works. But if the boys are tired and crabby, it might be here at six o'clock, that kind of reality. And I think that's what Francis says. That kind of a family where nobody can say, you don't know what we're going through. Angel can say, yes, I do. I have three little children under the age of three. <laughs> and that, that I think, is, is key for that first group. The second group, the, those who were baptized, but it didn't stick. Probably what? They never fell in love with Jesus. They heard it here, but it never sunk into here, right? So how do we re-engage them? And then I think for that group, a lot of those would be families, not individuals, not just youth or young adults, but families. And then the third group, those who truly don't know Jesus or thought they knew him and rejected out of not having the right information about him. So that speaks to the need for us to what? Train the faithful, the, train those in evangelization. Is that part of your uh, big picture? Do you say, as a staff, Who's responsible for this and how are we going to do it? How are we going to equip those faithful families to be evangelizers? It won't happen just if nobody says, I will step up and strategically look at how we can do that. Then outreach and formation to families. Doing more with families rather than individuals. And then the third one, going out to the highways and the byways and the farms and the, and the inner city, whatever it might be. And of course, the methodology that Francis recommends is dialogue, that we have hearts, heart to heart with those whom we are trying to engage. And dialogue means we listen as much as we talk, right? Francis has been really good at telling us to bite our tongue and not talk too soon, but to really let people share their faith journey first and um, to acknowledge that even if they haven't been inside church for eight years, they have some wisdom to share, and we'd better be listening to them. And that includes children. Um, uh, you know, there are so many uh, wonderful sites, although most of the ones I found on YouTube were not Catholic. We need to tape our little children talking about Jesus and, and the faith and, and so on, and um, uh, I'll, I'll show you that one later. Another way, I think, that we can engage those three groups is through intergenerational faith formation. I absolutely in my heart believe that sometimes we should gather, whether it's the core structure of our faith formation or just even a couple of times a year like Lent and Advent, but there should be times in every parish when everybody comes together to share and learn faith because that's the way we live. We don't live in age isolated groups. Thank God we don't. That would be really boring. So that is a way that, uh, and Francis always reminds us that the elders have a lot to teach us. I always tell my mom she has a lot to share. She's 92 years old, but look at all the wisdom that a 92-year-old has. And to connect to other generations. When I get cynical and jaded, I go hang around my great nieces and nephews because they can just boost my faith back up there. Um, if I, I'm feeling a little lackadaisical, I'll hang around teenagers because they'll challenge me and stretch me. That kind of uh, opportunity to connect to other generations is important. And Francis says 
don't be afraid of the questions. I used to be terrified by the questions. They're going to ask me something. And today, there are so many sticky issues. And we tend to avoid them when with young adults and youth, that's where we would gain credibility to talk about same-sex marriage, to talk about immigration issues, to talk about all the hot-button issues that are in people's lives, divorce, annulment, remarriage, and so on. And he said, we've got to have opportunities for the questions and not anticipate, uh, you know, not, uh, to not listen is to be thinking, what am I going to answer instead of being fully present to the person speaking. And, and Francis has challenged us on that and not to put words in other people's mouths or to assume we know what they're thinking. You know, our national directory way back in 2005 really echoes what Francis is saying today, which is every, this was specifically about young adult catechesis. I, that's my favorite section, uh, is the young adult part, because we really all want this. Because the NDC says, young adults deserve in your parish a place where they can ask any question, express any doubt or even disagreement with the church, and they won't be castigated for it. That, you know, uh, and the, the NDC goes on to say, that their questions will be answered. The church is teaching clearly articulated, but related to their life experience, not just out there in isolation. Don't you love, don't you go back to the NDC every once in a while to remind, because the vision there is so beautiful. So how have you built these opportunities that Francis is talking about, like for that place where people can question, for the opportunity to evangelize uh, the different groups and to go out to, uh, especially to deepen the faith of our, of our devoted Catholics. How have you built all of those ki kinds of things into your faith formation? Talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs>